Welcome to episode 239 of the Actual Astronomy Podcast, Summer, summer, summer Shorts and Favorite Fields, Observing Dark Nebula, A Beginner's Guide. I'm Chris and joining me is Shane. We're amateur astronomers who love looking up at the night sky and this podcast is for anyone else who likes going out under the stars. So have you ever looked at dark nebula, Shane? I have, um, mostly uh, kind of incidentally, <laughs> as I was observing other objects. And I I noticed this way more when I'm observing things around the Milky Way, but all of a sudden there's just no stars. And sometimes mm-hmm. it's like a very sharp border. And um, early on in my observing days, I never even really thought much of it. Just, oh, there's no stars there. And then, you know, as you learn more, it's no, actually there's stars there. We just can't see them and they're Mm. covered up by dark nebula. So I've definitely observed them, but I've never really made it uh, like a priority for an observing session. Um, But I think I should change that. Do you know who else noticed these things? Tell me. It was William Herschel of all people. And he was the first to actually note this down, or at least that's what some sources say. The uh, the indigenous population in uh, Australia actually drew whole constellation type patterns or features um, out of the dark regions of, uh, of the southern, the far south Milky Way. They had, for example, the dark emu. So uh, these things have definitely been noticed um, by peoples around the world going, going back for... Uh, you know, for, for many, many uh, thousands of years. Uh, but William Herschel, he was the first one to actually uh, note it down in uh, astronomical telescope sweeps, though. And in the 1780s, he wrote of Scorpius, here truly is a hole in the sky. So there was like a, a dark region that he was uh, looking at. Um, there's some other really dark regions in the area. Um, you know, there's the Ink Spot Nebula down there, and there's some other things. And uh, they sort of baffled astronomers uh, for quite some time, but it was Barnard in the early 20th century um, who who determined these were not holes or voids in space or black holes or any of that nature. Um, He discovered that they were masses of dust uh, that are made visible because they were contrasted against uh, the background uh, star clouds of the Milky Way. And, And how he made this discovery is quite fascinating. He made it on a cloudy night. So he was he was trying to do some photographs. He had taken his uh, Bruce telescope down to Mount Wilson. He had it set up and uh, was photographing the Milky Way in the early uh, 1900s. And uh, the clouds rolled in and he sat back and and he was looking at the clouds passing over the Milky Way, waiting for them to clear off so that he could pursue uh, photographing um, these uh, these voids or whatever these things were. And it, and it occurred to him that the clouds that were passing in front of the Milky Way were, were replicating, essentially, very, very easily seen to the unaided eye, what he was actually seeing in his uh, photographs of the Milky Way and had seen uh, in the telescope prior. And, and made the, the, the remarkable sort of eureka moment that that jump that so seldom actually happens in science that, holy smokes, this is, this is what these things likely are. And uh, certainly that, uh, that proved out. So I'm uh, going to read a bit of a dark nebula definition. So do you, do you want to read the definition from uh, Sky at Night magazine? Sky at Night magazine has a great definition of dark nebula. Do you want to go ahead and read it? Yeah, so a dark nebula is an interstellar cloud of cosmic dust that's so dense it absorbs, scatters, and blocks visible light, making it appear inky black when viewed against the starry cosmos. Uh, Famous examples of a dark nebula include the Coalsack Nebula, the Horsehead Nebula, and the Snake Nebula. Yeah, so these are the ones when people start talking about dark nebulae, at uh, an astronomy meeting or online or something, the, these are probably the ones that are going to get pointed to because they photograph well. Um, however, these are among the more challenging ones. Like I'm not knocking sky at night. I think think they do an excellent job. However, um, the coal sack is down in the Southern hemisphere, just off of crux. And uh, yeah, you can see it looks good in binoculars. I, I've seen it. Um, and then the Horsehead nebula up off uh, Zeta Orionis, um, is is pretty challenging. That's a pretty challenging object to see, um, B33. And then the Snake Nebula, B72, I've seen it. Holy cow, that is a tough um, uh, thing to see. So these are all sort of um, uh, objects that require a lot of uh, diligence, either to, to travel somewhere to see for many of us, 
or they're they're just challenging to see them in themselves. So so they get this reputation, dark nebula do, uh, of being extremely uh, difficult objects uh, for people to take a look at. But uh, the the it, it's actually the opposite that's true. These are some of the easiest things to see and uh, really can enhance your your observing. So. Uh, Shane, like the uh, stellar magnitude system of the stars, you know, we were familiar with like magnitude one through six and and fainter and fainter. Mm -hmm. um, dark nebula are rated on an opacity scale where one is uh, barely opaque. So it's pretty difficult to detect. And six is coal black. So when we're talking about these, we want to look for ones that have a uh, an opacity of six or that are very easy to see. Uh, in the nighttime sky. And the easiest one to see naked eye from a reasonably dark site, like my site here, I was looking at it the other night, is the uh, Great Rift. Do you ever look at the Great Rift? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Many times. Uh, it's impossible not to see it in, like, if you're in a dark sky and you can see the Milky Way um, in the summertime, you can you can easily see the Great Rift. It's the, uh, like, really that big dark band kind of in the middle. Yeah, so this is that that dark band, just like you described, and it's caused by interstellar clouds of cosmic dust that is, that is obscuring uh, the background Milky Way. Uh, Milky Way is our home galaxy. And uh, from our perspective on Earth, what's happening is just like where Barnard was seeing the clouds in our atmosphere between uh, he and, uh, and the Milky Way beyond, uh, we're seeing the exact same thing, except not in our atmosphere. These clouds are way out there in space towards the core um, of our Milky Way. So what's happening to you as the observer is uh, you're basically looking at Milky Way star clouds, um, but there are dark clouds in between you uh, and, and those star clouds beyond. So once once you get this trick down of actually seeing these for something in themselves, like when you look up and see that great rift as, as this, um, it makes it somehow this makes it easier to actually see dark nebulae. And I think that's where people stop. They, they just sort of recognize, oh, it's the Great Rift. And some people may think about it being, um, you know, this material, or they may just assume that there's no stars there because there's, there's a void or, or just vacant of stars for one reason or another. They haven't given it much thought. But once you actually start to absorb that information, uh, you can then start to see uh, lots of other interesting things. So, uh, let's see. I'm just going to run through the list really quick, and then we'll talk about them in detail. One is uh, LG3 or Le Gentil 3. The northern. Then there's the northern coal sack, Barnard Z. There's uh, B92 and B93, and then there's the uh, Pipe Nebula. Any of these ones uh, jump out at you right away as as ones that you've uh, enjoyed looking at in the past, Shane, or, or or is this pretty obscure for your observing? Uh, no, Barnard Z and the Pipe Nebula really do stand out. Um, in particular, Barnard Z, it's just so large. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's quite fascinating. And it's one of these objects that, um, you, you, like, I, I bet a lot of people have actually seen Barnard Z and just didn't realize it, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. uh, just looking yeah. up at the sky. And then when somebody points it out to you, uh, it's it's quite apparent. And um, again, it's it's really large. It's 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 a good one to to uh, put on your list. Yeah, and uh, and that's great that you've seen those and can confirm that these are not uh, super difficult to see. There's there's stuff that uh, even somebody who's casually interested and and uh, does a lot of other observing uh, is is able to kind of remark on. So uh, I'm going to add a few more for you to try to hunt down this summer machine when you get to a dark site. How's that sound? Perfect. Uh, all right. So just off Deneb. Um, and in fact, if you if you draw a line between Deneb and Zeta Cephei, um, there's a dark region. And really, it's just sort of to the north of Deneb. And it's huge. It's a huge, uh, dark region. And to my eye, uh, or at least when I was younger, to my eye, um, the region is so dark and differently colored that it almost has like a blue uh, hue to it, a bit of a blue texture. And it actually encompasses almost uh, eight degrees. So uh, it's it's pretty much one of the best dark nebula to see with your unaided eye. And it was discovered by a Le Gentil uh, and therefore is called LG3. I don't know what the other LG objects are actually, but this one is is the largest and uh, and one of the easiest ones to see with your eye. And it actually looks like a huge... Uh, it's a shark's casing or a skate's casing. 
um, for those that are that are also growing up on the coast. Um, and and it, so it looks like it has this bulge, and then it has sort of these little tentacles that kind of go out on uh, on either side. And uh, yeah, very easy to see just north of Deneb, and it's uh, and it's really really big. Just looks like this huge dark um, blue black ink splotch that's uh, that's covering that region, basically between Cygnus and Cephas. If you if you just find Cygnus, you find Cephas, you look between them, you won't see any stars there, and then just try to start tracing out um, this dark nebulae. How does that sound? Yeah, that's great. Moving on from there, one of the more popular ones, though, is the Northern Coal Sack. And oftentimes when people are told to look for the Northern Coal Sack by Deneb, they actually identify Le Gentil 3 and think that that's what they're they're looking at as the Northern Coal Sack. But the Northern Coal Sack is uh, between Deneb and Seder or just south of Deneb and Seder. And it's uh, it's much smaller. So you can actually fit the Northern Coal Sack in between... Um, uh, the, the field of view, like it's right in the field of view of your of your low power, like seven and a half degree uh, binoculars. And if you know where the North American nebula is, you can sort of pan over that, and uh, it and that forms the North American region and the Pelican region form like sort of one edge of it, and then the other edge is formed by uh, some of the uh, I think it's called the butterfly cluster. It's an icy object around Seder. And then, uh, then you have sort of Deneb and then some other uh, brighter Milky Ways uh, down towards uh, Gena there in, uh, in Cygnus. So that, that's another region that is excellent, excellent uh, binocular uh, dark sky hunting grounds. Did you, ever, did you ever look at that region through your little binoculars? Not through, well, probably at some point, I guess, through binoculars, but uh, I do spend a lot of telescope time in that area. And we should say I've made up little finer charts for a lot of this stuff. I don't know why I decided to do that, but I did. So maybe these can be sort of put out um, on our in our notes section. How does that sound? Yeah, yeah, we'll post it on our website, actualastronomy.com. Um, and if you want, you can also subscribe to our mailing list. And, and all that does is you get notification when we post show notes, because we don't always post them. But for uh, a lot of these episodes where we're talking about uh, objects to observe, we'll usually include either the list or finder charts. Um, so definitely check that out. So the next object we talked about briefly already, which is Barnard's E, and uh, Barnard's E is uh, is a dark uh, nebula region. It's actually called B142 slash B143. It's like two little regions, and uh, it's really cool. So E.E. E. Barnard, E.E. E. Barnard was uh, was the person who really uh, began sorting out the business of the dark nebulae, and then one of the sets that he found form um, like basically a backwards E in space. And uh, so I always thought that was really, really neat, uh, very coincidental. And it's also super easy to find. So all you do is you find the bright star Altair, which is in the bottom of the summer triangle, and just above and to the right or to the northwest of Altair is the orangish Terra Z. And Barnard's E is just a little bit, say maybe about two degrees um, to the uh, west of Terra Z. And through little binoculars from a reasonably dark site, it's very, very easy to see uh, Barnard's E. Yeah. All right. Move. Sorry, go ahead. No, no. I was just going to say um, th that's one of my favorites. Um, definitely check that out. Yeah. It looks like you're making some, some notes there. I was like, what's happening <laughs> to my notes? All right. Next, we're moving on to the small Sagittarius star cloud. So we talked about this as one of the star clouds to take a look at when you're scanning the summer Milky Way. And of course, um, lots of people are going to hunt that down as their Barnard object, or they're going to see it as their, uh, or as, as their Messier object when they're doing their Messier list. But there's actually a couple Barnard objects right there in uh, in the Sagittarius star cloud, and they are B92 and B93. It's almost like someone went and drizzled some black ink over top of the Sagittarius star cloud. So the, the best way to see these is probably through um, uh, like a decent four to five inch refractor or a six to eight inch uh, reflector, maybe up to a 10 or, or a 12 inch reflector. You want to keep a reasonably wide field of view and then just scan over the Sagittarius um, 
small Sagittarius star cloud, M24, and you'll start to run across these dark splotches and lanes. Um, I think one of the splotches is 92, and then the one with the lanes running down is, is 93, um, but it doesn't matter. You can refer to your chart um, and, and properly identify those. And that's really what people should be doing anyway, not just, not just listening to me ramble on, but you were saying in the, in the lead up to this, Shane, I think you said that, uh, that the uh, B92, B93, and I, I think a lot of these other objects are actually in the pocket star atlas from sky and telescope anyway. They, they are, um, there's a lot of dark nebula in the pocket sky atlas. So, uh, check it out if you're interested in these nebula and yeah, B92 and 93, are plotted in uh, in this pocket sky atlas. So, um, you know, great reference if you want to hunt some of this stuff down. So the last one we're going to talk about is the uh, pipe or the pipe and bowl nebula. I always like to call it the pipe and bowl. I, I know in Sky Safari, they call it the pipe bowl. Um, sometimes it's just called the pipe nebulae. But uh, I find this one is actually pretty easy to see, much easier than uh, than a lot of the other stuff um, that maybe people might be uh, thinking about when it comes to dark nebulae. And uh, the way to find um, the pipe and the pipe and bowl is, is to use uh, a binocular that has as close or as greater than an eight degree true field of view as possible. You do need uh, a very wide field of view in order to, to get the whole region uh, in your binoculars. And all you do is you find theta off Yuki which is halfway between Antares and Caus Borealis. So Antares is the brightest orange star in Scorpius and Caus Borealis is that top star uh, in the asterism of the teapot. So basically the, uh, the, 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 it would be the star that you would grab if you're going to pour the lid, take the lid off the teapot. That's Caus Borealis. So this sits right between them. Uh, it's a pretty wide region of sky. But all you do is find Theta off Yuki, which is the brightest star um, in that region. And then um, just below it, if you scan right below it, you're going to see there's like a set of stars. And they actually travel right along the northern range of the pipe area. And that actually uh, gives you an indication of where the bowl is going to be. And then you pan back left towards the east. And that's where the larger bowl part of uh, of this little uh, pipe and bowl dark nebulae asterism or feature is in the nighttime sky. And that's one of my favorite things to see because I know if I can see this through my binoculars, then I'm at a pretty good sight and uh, sort of from out here where I observe, this is something that I can just see. It's not, uh, it's not greatly visible. And uh, on only the best nights can I see it from here with the with the unaided eye. But if you get to really dark sites, this is just a spectacular dark nebula complex to start observing because once you see this, um, this forms the hindquarters of the dark prancing horse. And I, I reference you to uh, an Alan Whitman uh, Sky and Telescope article on that from uh, I think the early uh, 2000s or late 1990s. Uh, people should look that up if they're if they're interested in this. All right, Shane. So have I missed anything on the dark side of the nebulae? <laughs> no, really good overview and, and uh, you know, it gives everybody a few objects to try to hunt down this summer. All right. Well, thanks, Shane. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Be sure to subscribe. We need we need our subscribers. That's sort of like the number one thing. We're, we're really hoping that people will subscribe and enjoy these summer sessions. And we're always excited to get your observing emails to actualastronomy at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening, everybody. Thank you everyone for listening and we hope you enjoyed the show. If you are interested in more information, would like to contact us, or if you would like to support the podcast, check out our website, actualastronomy.com. <laughs>